All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Van Cleef, and I am a business development consultant helping Oracle developers and product managers educate our users on Oracle technology. Thank you for joining us today at Autonomous Database Office Hours REST API Deep Dive. We're very excited to be able to share with you how to set up and use the service APIs with the Autonomous Database. If you have any questions during the webcast, please place them in the Q&A area. We have a number of solution experts available to answer your questions throughout the session. And then if time permits, we'll also answer questions live after the presentation. This webcast is being recorded and we'll make it available shortly after the webcast concludes. Today's session will be presented by Robert Green, Senior Director of Product Management. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Robert. Okay, yeah. Hey, thanks everyone for uh, joining me today yeah, to talk about the APIs with Autonomous Database. Let me share my screen. And uh, yeah, my desktop because I'm going to switch back and forth between the uh, a PowerPoint and uh, an, an IDE. And so to get started, let me bring up this PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the agenda. So I'm going to give the one slide intro for the newbies who don't know anything about autonomous database. And then we're going to do a quick review of the tools that are available to you as a developer. And, uh, and then we're going to look specifically at the Eclipse environment and uh, show you how to get that set up and use that to sort of get connectivity to using APIs against Oracle Cloud. And once we have that set up, you'll see how we'll leverage what we did there to then actually within that IDE, start to look at the APIs and, uh, and use this sort of the same connectivity model to get authenticated for using those APIs, um, give a review of the classes that are most relevant to, to doing database development uh, in Oracle Cloud with these APIs and go through some of the request response builder patterns and you know, look at the CRUD operations for database and highlight some of the key things that you want to be aware of. And uh, yeah, and then we'll, you know, we'll sort of close up and, and go into Q&A, okay? So uh, to start with, autonomous database. So for those of you who haven't spent any time with us, autonomous database is super cool. Uh, it really is kind of a new paradigm for database where everything gets automated. So you can get the sort of best in class Oracle database um, but you can get it, you know, in, in minutes. It's uh, the, the full sort of what we call maximum availability architecture. Um, so it gives the ultra performance, ultra reliability, and yet um, it self tunes. So this is the really cool thing. You just write your code and turn on, you know, some of the auto tuning stuff and it actually will tune itself for you and improve over time. And so it's, it, it adds uh, a lot of value for developers and, and companies who don't have these like super deep dive DBAs, we're kind of moving away from this world where we need the, the super duper experts um, from a DBA perspective, and we're getting automation and autonomous behavior in the database layer. So enough on that. Um, there are various IDEs that we've integrated with, uh, our cloud APIs integrated with, in order to help developers, uh, Visual Studio, Eclipse, and then there's really popular drivers for the languages that are out there that a lot of people are using. If you're if you're using you know, Python or Go or um, you know .NET, you've got language drivers for pretty much all the popular languages. And then if if you're a larger shop and you're you kind of have a separation of duties between your um, uh, d development uh, line of businesses and your sort of uh, uh, operations guys, there's the DevOps tool chain that we're integrated with Terraform, PowerShell, Ansible, Jenkins, Chef, you know, all those things that, that uh, people like to use these days. Um, so what I have here is a slide because with this webcast, you're going to be able to download the presentation and actually the code as well that I'm going to show you uh, in this, in this presentation. And so as I walk through, I'm going to use different resources. And this is just a slide with all the the links to the different pages that I'm using to show you how to set things up and to get started. Okay, so you can come and get this later on. Now, like I said, I'm personally gonna do this through Eclipse. I'm gonna use Java, okay? It's the language 
but the patterns and everything that you're going to see today are very common um, regardless, just subtle differences um, with respect to your language. Now, uh, Eclipse has a toolkit that we produce that you can add into your Eclipse environment. And that basically gives you an autonomous database cloud console and, and also our compute and all that right there inside your IDE. Okay. And so you'll see it, it's been loaded because you'll have this little cloud icon. So if we look at my Eclipse environment, uh, you will see that uh, I, I already have that the little cloud icon in there. Okay. So I'm going to show you like how to get this all set up and working in directly inside the IDE and, and use that to get to the APIs. Okay. So back to the presentation deck. So first of all, to get started with this, you need to get the Eclipse toolkit. Okay. So to get that, you go to GitHub, Oracle, OCI toolkit, Eclipse releases and do the download. It's, it's you know, very straightforward, right? There's a, uh, close this out. Um, let's see, you know why I've got this uh, menu item that's overlapping my screen here and I can't seem to get rid of it. Um, but in the releases tab, right? Uh, you know, again, at this site, you know, just go and download this uh, Eclipse update and this will give you what you need, okay? Now, once you have it, it's easy to install. Uh, if you're not familiar with installing things in Eclipse, it's, it's, it's very simple. Go to the help menu, go to install new software, go to add archive and select that um, uh, zip file that you just downloaded. And that'll bring it into your Eclipse environment. So if I were to come into Eclipse and I were to uh, go to the uh, help menu, go to install new software, and go to add an archive, and I can come and I can find that Eclipse uh, zip file and open that up, okay? And I've already done it, so I'll back out of this, but it's, it's that simple, okay? And that brings this into your Eclipse environment. Now, to use it is a little bit uh, more difficult because to use it, you have to get authenticated with our cloud, right? So that's part of the setup of using it. Once you've installed it, you have to set it up. And uh, to set it up is pretty straightforward too. And it's the same thing you would do to use the actually SDK APIs. And that's why I'm taking you down this path. Um, you have to go to the Oracle Cloud into your tenancy. And for you as a user, you need to basically get yourself an API key. Okay. And that's how you get authenticated with a private public um, PEM key that authenticates you to use the uh, the APIs. And so if you go to the Oracle Cloud, I'm going to log in to Oracle Cloud. And I, I'm using my tenancy. Of course, you need to have your own tenancy. If you need to sign up, you sign up for one of the uh, uh, free ones. Log into the cloud to show you that uh, as it, when you go, come over here to this user icon, right, and click on yourself as a user, and that brings you into the page where you can uh, deal with API keys. So in order to use APIs, you have to come here and you have to add an API key. Now, I have a couple of API keys already, but you would um, basically click on this and generate an API key pair for yourself. I mean, you could upload them and all that, but in general, you'd want to download a private key, okay? And, and then hit add. And that's going to add another new, it'll generate a new public key and put the fingerprint and all that stuff in here. And it'll download then the private key um, that goes along with it, okay? Now, once you've uh, got this, um, API key in place, if you come over to the menu uh, on the particular key that you just generated, you can view the configuration file. Okay, now if you view this file, you see that um, you can copy the contents of this file out. And what it does is it gives you the ability to create a local configuration file from that copy. So you just hit the copy button, copy it out, 
Okay. And then you come back to your laptop and you create a file with the contents. Okay. So in my case, um, I have a, uh, uh, let's see, where am I at here? Um, I'm already in, so I'm, I'm in a particular directory here, users under my, um, my uh, base directory under an Eclipse OCI config, and I have this file called configuration. So I've already copied the contents into that file. And if I cat that, you can see the contents of that file. Um, and, uh, and this isn't all exactly correct because I don't want people having my passphrases and all that. But nonetheless, you see that basically you can set up different users inside this file. But if you just copy it straight out, paste it in here, you're going to have what you need. The only thing you need to do then is you need to basically modify this one value to point to the location of your key. Okay, that private key that you downloaded. Okay, so for me, it's, it's here in this particular location. And so that basically pairs you up with all the configuration information in terms of your uh, identity, your unique identity and your tenancy information, all that with the private key um, that works to get you authenticated. Okay. Now, uh, once you have that set up, you can come back to Eclipse and in Eclipse, in this cloud configuration, you click on the little cloud. Okay. And, and basically go and browse and find that configuration file. And when you find that configuration file, it's going to pre-populate and load all this information um, straight out of that file. Okay. So once you've done that, you're done. Right? You, should, you should be uh, set up and able to connect to the cloud. Now, to test that out, when you install this plugin, you also get a... Uh, uh, a tab down here that lets you browse and look at, you know, the compute instances, autonomous databases, your Kubernetes stuff, object storage. But for autonomous database, you just double click this and it'll open up a little browser on your autonomous databases. Now, when you browse your databases, anything you do in Oracle Cloud is always with respect to some compartments. You have to configure a compartment and, uh, and that that's your scope, right? So you're then looking at all the resources inside that compartment. And you can do that here. So if you open this up, now, the fact that I was even able to open this and get a listing of the compartments means that I was able to authenticate. It means that the setup of my config file and my, my directory pointing to the PEM file, my private key, is all good because I could get in here. So from here... I can select a compartment that I know has interesting stuff in it. Like for me, I know it's the app compartment. Okay. And then I come and double click autonomous database. And it's going to look at that compartment. You can see it's looking at this compartment here. And boom, it shows me all of the databases that are there inside that compartment. Now, uh, if you select any one of these databases, you can uh, right click on it and take actions on that database. Now, of course I can create brand new databases, okay? But I also, for the existing database, I can clone it, you know, I can, I can uh, get a connection to it or, or uh, um, uh, download the wallet credentials so that I get connected to it, set up a JDBC driver, I can start it, stop it, scale it up and down. I can do all those things that I would normally do in the Oracle Cloud but I, I can do them right inside my IDE. So I don't even have to leave my IDE. Now it's not quite as responsive as the public cloud. You know, you have to go and kind of refresh the list every now and then uh, as compared to the, the public cloud, which is, which is very active. Um, but nonetheless, you really don't have to leave the IDE. Now, of course, you know, creating databases in a UX is kind of cool uh, just to get started and play around. But what we're here to talk about is how that you can automate that through code so that you can stand up, for example, uh, test environments and all that where you want to you want to regress a bunch of code that you've written. And it's some of that code is going to access databases. So you want ways to like spin up an entire stack repeatedly, uh, start from a base configuration, run your tests, unit tests, make sure everything looks good. And then you tear it all down and you you. You, you do it again, right? And, and you, you modify that and add code over time. 
So that's really hard to do through a UX control, right? You need to do that through code. And so that's what we're here to talk about. Um, now, uh, let me go back to the uh, presentation and I, I probably skipped a few things here, but um, we talked about getting the API key. Uh, we talked about um, setting up and, and uh, accessing a particular compartment to look at databases, create databases. And the fact that you could do that means that, that that configuration file is good and the reference to the key is good, okay? So now you wanna start doing real API development, okay? To do that, well, first you gotta get the APIs, okay? And in my case, I'm getting the uh, Java APIs. So again, you go to GitHub, Oracle, in this case, OCI Java SDK releases, and you download the, um, uh, in, in this case, Java SDK, okay? And, and so, you know, again, it's very straightforward. Uh, you know, there's, a, again, if you go there to the Java SDK site, you can just come and, and download this zip file that's got all of the classes, it's got examples in it, it's got all the dependencies, you know, everything is in there, okay? Now, uh, to, um, to use this, of course, you know, you get it into your Eclipse environment. And I, you know, I'm I gotta assume that you know a little something about Eclipse. And so it's not that big a deal. You know, you can uh um you can add it to a project, uh a palm if you're, if you're using a Maven kind kind of project setup, you just go in and add the dependency um for the OCI Java SDK, and then you can add the different uh um uh, uh, modules that you will use from that bill of material. So in this case, you know, the, the core modules or, uh, in, or that more, more importantly for what we're talking about, the database, although you need them both um, and just add those dependencies. And, and that puts you in a position where, you know, within a file, you can, you know, look to do these imports. If you import uh, you know, com.oracle, you can start to see all of these different packages that you have here. Um, with respect to the uh, developing with these these APIs, okay, that's simple. Uh, now, um, or you can just uh, you can just go and literally like open up, you know the the uh, um, you know project properties, and you can add into your class path the jar files that you need, right? Which is actually what I've done here. So you get yourself set up, and and that's it. Once, you, once you've done that, you've added um, those uh, libraries to your class path, basically, for your project, one way or the other, uh, then you're ready to develop. And so let's start looking at what does that mean to develop against these APIs. Uh, so we're, we're, um, we've got the SDKs into our Eclipse. Now, there's a a couple of things that you um, first of all would need to know, which is that you you do the work against these APIs using client classes, okay? And these client classes are scoped to a, a particular set of resources, um, for example, in the area of identity. So you have an identity client if you're going to deal with users, groups, compartments, tags. You know, if you're going to deal with networking, you have a virtual network client to deal with all the networking stuff, right? If you're going to do a database, you have a database client. And the idea behind these um, uh, uh, various classes, client classes, is that these require you to kind of authenticate. And this is where, you know, to get an instance of these clients, you're going to go and, and, and use that configuration file. And then once you've authenticated, you then can use that client in order to act on the resources, Okay. Now there's a couple of other resources. Um, we're gonna talk about database waiters because this is a, a very important that sometimes when you're acting on these, uh, these cloud resources, like provisioning, uh, for example, a new uh, infrastructure, it, you know, it can take quite a long time. It could take hours. And so you know, if you, if you wanna have follow on actions after you create one of these resources, sometimes you need to wait until it's complete. And so there are, ways um, through the database waiters class that you can wait for the life cycle to, to reach uh, you know, an available state or depending on what you're doing, some other state. 
that you want to be in before you start doing the follow on activity. Um, so I'm going to show you about how to deal with waiters. And then there's also some asynchronous classes. This is really the same thing as waiters, but if you're familiar with Java using Java futures, it basically allows you to, to use that paradigm um, in order to introduce weights. Uh, and if you're, you know, uh, working in a situation where you're in like a big company and you have a ton of databases, ton of, you know, cloud resources, you may need to use paginators, um, you know, so that you can deal with the, these, these streaming, these lists of resources back in chunks. Okay. Those are the kind of the core things that you would use. So I want to talk about authenticating first, because that's the free to create a, You have to create a client that authenticates. And there's two ways you can do that. First of all, you can basically use the configuration file setup, which is in essence what we did with the Eclipse toolkit. Okay. And we're actually going to use this pattern a lot, or you can um, use a builder pattern where you create authentication details um, kind of explicitly using one of these um, simple auth providers and where you go and you, you declare, you can see the same contents that was in your config file. You can say what your tenant ID is, say what your, you know, who you are as a user, what the fingerprint is, and you can build it. Okay. But this approach with the config file tends to be easier. And so if we look in our code, I've opened up one little class and I've, I've kind of chunked out my examples in a way that I can easily show it to you and, and we can consume it. So in order to do this, you have to create an authentication details provider, okay? And once you have that provider, okay, you can then create a new identity client or database client or virtual network client or whatever client by passing in that provider to the constructor, okay? That's how you create these client classes. Now, in terms of the auth itself, it's, it's in a method that I've got down here, right? And so what are we doing? Well, we're declaring the path where you find the configuration file. We're declaring the user. The pro, it, profile is basically the user inside the file that you want to use to authenticate. And then you're taking this config file reader class and you're saying, hey, parse the path and the user. Okay, so it pulls the, the tenant, the user ID, the fingerprint, all that stuff for that particular user out of the config file. And once you've got that stuff out in a config file um, template, you then create, uh, based upon the config file, you create the authentication details provider. Okay, and return that. Okay, that's just bringing it back up here. So now that's that's how you get a provider. We'll we'll repeat this pattern again and again and again in all these different examples. So you know I'll just we won't go over it again, but it'll be you'll see it. Okay, um, and so we can run this, and you can just see how it will uh, do what it's supposed to do and authenticate itself, assuming that my setup is right. Um, and uh, by the way, I have this. Yeah. Eclipse issue with uh, resolving the um, the logger. Don't worry about that. Um, but you can see that I created uh, an instance of identity client, and then I called this method uh, on the client to set the region. So it's actually working, okay, uh, and no errors. And then eventually I close the client. Now, because these are authenticated connections, you know, you really do, after you're done using them, you want to close them. So regardless of the type of client, make sure that you close them after you use them. Okay. So that's uh, authenticating. Now, uh, we'll go back to the presentation. And so the, now what I want to do is I want to talk about this request response builder pattern. So, uh, Underneath these language SDKs ultimately is a REST-based API. And so we're just exploring how to leverage that REST-based API through a particular language. And, and so we, we follow this request response builder pattern in order to um, take actions against the cloud resources. And the way that you use this request and response um, packages and, and the set of classes 
is by basically issuing different command types. So you know, this could be a, a get, it can be an update, it could be a list, you know, different kinds of commands against these different either request or response classes. And there's a core set of classes that are the important ones that you would do for database. One of those is the autonomous Exadata infrastructure. Another is the autonomous VM cluster. Okay. Then you have the autonomous container or autonomous container database. Then you have the autonomous database itself. And then you got backups. Okay. Those are really the core classes that you would take actions against. Now, uh, of course, to do some of these things, you have to leverage other identity objects. You have to leverage networking. So we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is today we have this autonomous Exadata infrastructure, um, but we're moving to a model where we have a common Exadata infrastructure where we're going to be able to deploy VMs that are both what we call co-managed, so non-autonomous services, just automation services, alongside of autonomous. And so we already do that in our Cloud at Customer. So if you're using Cloud at Customer and you're writing API stuff, you want to use Exadata infrastructure, not autonomous Exadata infrastructure. Okay. And when we introduce this model for public cloud, you'll then see the VM cluster. And again, it's it's there already for Cloud at Customer, but um, you would use this. Uh, when you, you use this VM cluster model um, within this uh, Exadata infrastructure. So when you're standing up Exadata infrastructures, you'll either use autonomous VM clusters or you'll use um, regular VM clusters for the co-managed stuff, okay? So look for that, that change will come out in the summer, uh, but it's already there for Cloud at Customer. Now, so it's this pattern that you, you'll use again and again, okay, where um, you create a client, right, one of those various kinds of uh, clients, you'll create a command method, okay, um, where you're trying to get a response. So it's a response object, okay, and you do that by taking your client and issuing the command, okay, and then for that command, you're going to say, I want for that command, I want to create a request object. And, and I want to build that request object. And by building that object, what you basically are doing is you're adding in the details for the various parameters, almost like filling out a JSON object that you want in that request. Okay. And once you build that, it's going to return a response to you. Okay. Now, sometimes those parameters are really simple, like a string. Okay. Or, or an int or something. And sometimes those parameters are another kind of object. And when they're another sort of kind of object, then you need to basically create uh, a details object for that command, okay? And you'll see this in your class hierarchy. You'll see where you've got these more complex types and you need to create a details object. And you create a details object the same way that you create request objects, you use a builder pattern, okay? And so this becomes the, the, the overall pattern that you use to, to iterate um, on accessing different objects. It's, it's you, you look for a response by issuing a request with, with details um, for that request. Once you've got the response, okay, then you can get from the response your actual objects, the, the instances that you're looking to, to get at, whether it's a database or a container database or a backup, you can basically get that type and then work with it. Okay, so that's the pattern. Now, I'm going to give you an, a, a concrete example of that. Um, this is a concrete example of that using a virtual network. So in, in this case, the client is a, is a virtual network client, and the command is you want to create a subnet. Okay. And so again, the command create subnet has a response class, okay? And so you take the client in virtual network in this case, and you issue the command to create the subnet. And then 
what do you need to do? You need to create a request for that command with a builder, okay? And when you build, in this case, it's one of the more complex ones. And so you need to create a, a, a details object for that same command, create subnet, okay? So we create the details using a builder. In this case, it's a subnet. So would you expect, well, where do you want the compartment for the new subnet? Which availability domain? What's the, the display name for this subnet? What's the VCN that the subnet's gonna be associated with it? What's its CIDR block? And all the things that you expect you know, for um, a subnet, okay? So we use that pattern, okay? And here's, um, uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to um, another one of my examples and I'm gonna do a, a kind of top-down, I'm gonna do a creating of a, an autonomous database. Now, when we create the autonomous database, I, I'm actually going to uh, uh, go top down. So I'm going to go create autonomous database. Then autonomous databases live in a, a container, right? So an autonomous database container, which live inside of infrastructures. Okay. Now, normally you would build bottom up. Okay. But to build bottom up, we have to look at dependencies and all that. And I'm going to defer that a little bit until I give you an understanding of just how to work with resources. So I'm going to go top down. So this is creating an autonomous database. Now, um, because I'm going top down, not bottom up, I can't, I can't get, I can't build the bottom and then grab the identities of the um, pieces on the bottom in order to build the upper layers. So I just went into the cloud and I went to uh, any one of my resources and I can show you, for example, uh, if I go back into the cloud and I go to autonomous database, every one of these resources, I'm, I'm looking in the app compartment, every one of these resources, if you click on them, you can get a copy of its OSID. That's the identity for that particular resource, okay? And so I've just done that for the app compartment and for a container database called PMACD, okay? Um, so I've grabbed those keys. Since I'm going top down, I have to use things that already exist, okay? Now, I authenticate. There's nothing new here. This is what I showed you in the first example. So I get authenticated with my client. Now I have a database client. Once I have the database client, I can now follow the pattern, right? Now the pattern is I want a response for creating an autonomous database. In order to get a response, I have to take my client and issue the command. And in the command, I have to give a request, okay, for that command and I wanna build it. And when I build it, I build it with details for that command, okay? And when I say build, that's gonna go out and get my response, okay? Once I have the response, I can go to the response and say, hey, get me the object, get me the autonomous database, right? And so now I have a local instance that I can work with. In this case, I'm gonna say, give me a display name, okay? Now this details that the, this this details object that I'm passing in, I'm I'm creating that before I get to this response request builder pair, uh, pattern. So this I'm calling a, a local method to create this details using the app compartment ID that I showed you above and the container database ID that I showed you above. So I'm coming into this method. Okay, with those IDs, and I'm saying, hey, return me the details, and I'm going to build it, okay, using a builder pattern, and I'm going to give it the compartment ID that I passed in. It's a database, so I'm going to give it the core count. I'm going to give it the storage size. I'm going to give it a display name. I'm going to give it an admin password. I'm going to give it a... Uh, um, uh, the container database ID that it's going to live in. I'm going to give it the, you know, is it dedicated or is it shared? In this case, it's dedicated. Uh, and the workload, okay, the database workload. In this case, 
it's OLTP. I mean, maybe I'm creating one that's a data warehouse, et cetera. So you have different workload types. And again, I say to build that and that causes it to, to actually get created and it causes it to return. And then I pass it into the pattern. Okay, so it's really pretty straightforward. And this, you'll see this pattern again and again and again. So if we run this uh, Java application, you'll see it go through and execute, creating an autonomous database. Okay, oh, and in this case, it actually failed. Uh, already a database with that name exists, okay. So obviously I've run this before. So let me, um, let me create a different one, all right? Get a different name, compile that. So at least you know it's live. <laughs> okay, run this. And this time I should get a new database. Okay, so it's creating this database and there it is, okay? It's saying, go check the cloud console. You should see the database. So if we go look at the cloud console, Go to autonomous database. Again, we, we're in the app compartment. That's the app, the compartment that uh, we were targeting. And there it is. There's my SDK demo two. See, this is the one that already existed. And so you can see that it's in the provisioning state. Okay. Now this is what I was talking about, the state. These states can be in different, different, uh, um, well, different states. You'd be scaling, you could be backing up, you could be provisioning, et cetera. So sometimes you have to wait to get to the right state before you take the next action, okay? So if we go back, um, the next thing that I wanna show you before we deal with this uh, waiting stuff is if you have existing resources, then you can simplify this response request pattern to just pass in a builder with the ID of the resource. And so it's, it becomes simpler to load uh, an existing resource if you have its ID. So when you build bottom up, you have to, you know, a fairly complex um, statement in order to get the base resource. And then once you get it, you can grab the, the, the keys, the IDs to these reference resources. And then to build those, it's a much simpler pattern, okay? And here I have an example of doing it um, where I'm using a database client to get an autonomous container database, right, from uh, uh, an existing um, key, okay? Now, if we go to the code, I can show you getting a resource by ID. So here, again, you know my container database ID that I had in that previous example. I, I have it again here. You know my... Um, let me see move this down a little bit. You know my authentication pattern. So I get a database client. Once I have the client, I say, hey, get me an autonomous container database. And in this case, for the get autonomous container database request, okay, for this request, I get a builder and I just pass in the ID, right? The ID that I have up here. And when I ask to build it, this entire thing gives me a response, okay? And from the response, I can, again, get the actual object, right? In this case, I'm creating a CDB. And so once I have an autonomous container database, you know, now I can ask uh, questions of that object, like give me your display name, okay? And assuming that I got a valid object, it, it will succeed. So here you can see if I run this, that we can a little bit easier get at um, this autonomous container database, right? So this is the print statement here, autonomous container database. And I was able to ask that CDB, what's your display name? And there in fact is the display name, okay? So let's go back to uh, this PowerPoint. Okay, and so now I wanna talk about checking and waiting for lifecycle. If we go, um, and it's the same kind of pattern. You create a, a waiter, basically using the, remember that in my case, I'm using a database waiter, um, database waiters, right? 
And to, to create that waiter, you, you take a client, database client, and say, you know, get your waiters for that type of client. And then you basically say, hey, I need a response, but I, I want the waiter to wait for this resource. And I pass in the request for the resource and the life cycle state that I want it to wait for. Okay. And then I ask it to execute. Okay. And so then it's going to go off. And until this thing has reached the life cycle state that I specified, um, it won't return. Okay. And this is how you can, and if, of course it's, if it's already in that state, it'll return immediately. So you can just validate that it's in the right state. And then you can go forward and you can do something with the object. So if we go to the code, um, I'm going to show you, we have uh, a, a method here that we'll run through. So again, uh, I have got a database ID, okay, for a database that already exists in there. And it's actually called Eclipse ATP. Um, and I'm going to get a database client. And for that database client, I'm then going to take the client and get its waiters, okay? So I now have this waiter. And what I'm going to do is for that waiter, I'm going to say, for an, wait for an autonomous database where the request is to get an autonomous database, okay? And so I'm going to build this request, okay? And then I'm going to pair that request with the autonomous database lifecycle state available and ask it to execute okay so if it's in the available state it will just execute right through if it's not it'll wait here before it comes down and executes now let's go and uh and check this resource out so there is uh an eclipse atp database here okay um and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to scale this guy okay in this case i'm going to scale it down let me scale it down to two ocpus Okay, and I want to update it. So this is going to go into scaling. Okay, now notice it's still green because scaling is still an online operation. So uh, that's the neat, one of the neat, really neat things about autonomous databases is that um, when you're taking some of these actions that in like other cloud services would normally result in database downtime, like if you needed to scale uh, an RDS instance, you know, from eight cores to 12 cores or something like that. You have to, you end up having to shut down the VM. You take downtime, your app is down and you restart the VM with a larger shape, okay? Um, so here in Autonomous, it can do these things online, which is, which is awesome, okay? So my apps are not broken while this scaling is happening, but nonetheless, I'm in a different state. My state is scaling in progress. And if I go back, um, to this, this table, um, you can see that my, the state of this database is scaling in progress. And it actually happens really quick in the back end, but it takes a while for all of the metadata and everything to reflect that it's properly scaled uh, here. And because when, you, when you're manually scaling like this too, it's changing the memory ratios, it's changing everything, right? Um, so um, it's doing a scaling operation. So if I go back to this um, class, this database ID is actually pointing at that Eclipse database. So if I say to run this, okay, this goes and runs and it's checking the state before proceeding. So it did not, okay, it executed this print statement and it did not pass through and execute these print statements, okay? Why? It's waiting, right? It's waiting for this thing to become available. Now, um, this is exactly what you want to happen. So if we go back to the cloud console, as long as this thing is still scaling in progress, it's gonna wait until it becomes available again. Okay, so while we're seeing how this works, I wanna talk about the last component. The last component, which is really where you, you would need these waiters to, to build bottom up, is the autonomous uh, exadata infrastructure or creating exadata infrastructure. So for this class, I want to spend a little time making sure that you understand uh, the details behind it. Uh, oh, you know what? Before I do this, I, I, I want to do the, the 
the container database because right? I just did the the regular database. So now, now databases, autonomous databases live in a container. So here I do the same thing, uh, get authenticated but with my client. And I, and I basically go through the same uh, response request details pattern for the container database, okay, that we just described. But what I wanted to show you is that when I do the details, when I create the details for this request, um, a container database is, a, is an environment where uh, you can control the software version, you can control the maintenance scheduling and all that. So you can create in dedicated, you can create these separations between dev test, staging, prod, and you can roll the patches and the software versions out differently through these different releases. And so I wanted to show you that, that, that when you create a, an autonomous database, um, I'll just create a different number here, um, to create an autonomous database, you can uh, build the maintenance windowing details and the patch model details to go with it, okay? Um, and, and the patch model, if you know the Oracle database patching model, you can use release or, re or release update revisions. Um, and so the maintenance windowing, I wanted to show you that. To do the maintenance windowing, you create an instance of maintenance window and you pass in the months that you're willing to have patched, the, the weeks of, that month, of those months you're willing to have patched, the days, the hours. And so, you, you know, you can create something very macro and say, hey, I don't care when you, you patch me, just do it in the months of, uh, you know, February, May, you know, uh, July, you know, what, what have you, okay? Um, anytime during the month. Or you can get very granular all the way down to a specific um, hour or, or a start, start window. And so here, you know, I'm saying, hey, patch me each quarter, patch me in the first month of the quarter. So do it in February, do it in May, August, November. Okay, so the first month of every quarter. And then I'm, I'm building this list of months. Then I'm saying, hey, for the weeks, um, I just want to do week one. Okay, so, you know, there's four weeks in a month. And so always the first week in the first month. And then I'm saying, well, which days of the week? Only on Saturdays. Okay, so I'm creating a list that includes only Saturdays. And then I'm saying, hey, start me on, on the hours of 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., okay? And so for the hours, you pass in an integer uh, 0, 4, 8, 12, et cetera, where um, uh, 0 would be like midnight until 4 o'clock in the morning, and 4 would be like 4 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the morning, and 8 would be till 8 o'clock in the morning until noon, right? So you can basically choose... And, and add these different uh, potential start windows. Okay, so you build that, build that up and then you pass it in here um, into this, I'm passing it in uh, to the create container request into the maintenance window details. Okay, so that's how you build a container database that has a, a custom maintenance schedule, okay, through API. So if we, if we run, oh, by the way, notice that this completed. So if we, if we go back to, the cloud console, when we look at Eclipse ATP, it's become available. Okay, so our waiter continued. Okay, so if we run this uh, create container database, uh, this should go off and do what it needs to do. Uh, in this case, I'm creating uh, API container four. So if we go to the cloud, and we go to our container databases. So this is when you're when you're doing dedicated. If you're doing infra shared, uh, shared, you don't need to worry about any of the infrastructure stuff. But you can't control the maintenance windows. You can't control the separation of dev tests from prod and all that. Okay. If we look at container databases um, in this fleet compartment, which is where I created that. Uh, you can see this new container database getting provisioned. Okay. So now let's go back. We're going to talk about the infrastructure. Now, the infrastructure is um, something which uh, is a little more complex because it involves networking. Now, when you get to the cloud at customer model or when we introduce multi-VM, the networking that I'm showing you here is going to happen on the VM resource. 
But right now, when there's no multi-VM, it happens in the Exadata resource. And so here, same thing. I authenticate a client, okay? And in this case, I don't just authenticate the database client, but I also do a virtual network client, okay? Because I'm going to do networking, okay? And then what I do is I create a VCN. And for that VCN, I create a subnet, okay? And then, uh, so yeah, the same VCN, okay? And then once I have the VCN and the subnet, I, it's not called create, it's actually called launch. I launch an autonomous exadata infrastructure. And I do that with details that I have to build, um, which includes the subnet information uh, from the subnet that I created and the VCN, okay? So, um, so here I create, I create the, the details and then I go through the re response request uh, details um, pattern that, that I had showed you before, okay? So it's exactly the same pattern and I launched this, uh, this Exadata infrastructure. Now, what I wanna show you is when, you, when you're creating these, uh, the VCN and the subnet, I'm actually using a helper class. In the SDK, you have examples and the helper class exists in those examples. So you should look at this helper class. But in this helper class, that's where we actually do the create VCN and all that, okay? And what I wanna show you is um, what's important is back in this uh, presentation, when we create the autonomous exadata infrastructure, it's an active active cluster that we're we're creating. And so the cluster and the nodes inside that cluster need to be able to communicate with each other. And so we create this subnet and we give it to that active active cluster. And so for them to communicate with each other, they need to communicate over ICMP, they need to ping each other and they communicate over UDP and TCP. So you basically need to open up the security rules so that they can communicate over those protocols. Okay? So if we go back to the code you can see what's happening here is I'm going through the same, for the virtual network client, the same pattern, I'm getting a response, create the VCN, you know, I create a request and do it as a builder. Give me the details. And for the details, the CIDR block, the compartment where I want that VCN to show up, all those things. And I build this. Now, notice what I do is I build it. And then I come down and I say, hey, for that client, Give me your waiters, okay, so we can wait and wait for the VCN, okay, to what? To, to become available. So I don't proceed until I have a proper VCN. When I have a proper VCN, then what I come to do is, is, is set up these security rules that I just talked about. So uh, I, I need an egress rule you know, for this particular network where the cluster's at, you know, you can communicate outwards to the world. So you kind of open things up for the entire world, right? Um, but as far as the ingress rules to these different VMs, you, you want to restrict it to just inside that, that particular subnet. And so I say, I want to create an ingress rule, okay, using a builder, everything uses these builder patterns where the source is going to be from within the CIDR block of that subnet only. And I could do each protocol independently, UDP, TCP. In this case, it's just saying all, but it's basically building these security rules. Okay. And then it's going out and it's, it's, it's creating a security list. Okay. Where I'm, I'm getting the security list from the VCN. And I'm saying, hey, get me your default security list ID and build a request to, to give back that default, okay? And so um, I, I could build a security list specifically for the subnet, but if the subnet doesn't have a security list, it looks to the default security list in the VCN. So that's what's happening here is I'm using the default VCN security list. And once I get that security list, um, I then, uh, you know, using this response, I then take that and I add in uh, the egress rules. I, I say, hey, give, give me your, give me all the egress rules for that security list and add my new rule that I just created above. 
give me all the uh, uh, ingress rules for that security list and add the rule that I created above, okay? And this opens up the networking for that Exadata infrastructure to properly function with an active active cluster, okay? And so once I add this information to the default security list, I need to update that list. That, again, there's a command, update, okay? And I need details for that command. So I create a details object using a builder and I say, Set the set the ingress rules to this the, the the new set of ingress rules that I just modified here, and set the ingress rules also to the security list new modified set, and build that list. Okay, as an update details, and then I just go through and build the request object with those details, right? And ultimately, uh, I. Uh, issue the update. Okay, very straightforward. And I'm not going to run this because uh, running the create exit infrastructure is going to stand up an entire quarter rack, uh, which is you know, which is a pretty heavy heavyweight request. But you you get the idea. And and those are the important points in creating a more complex resource. Once you have that exit infrastructure, normally that's where you would then build up. Right now, you can you have the ID of that infrastructure. You can use that to build containers with different maintenance windows. You, for each of those containers, you can build more databases in it. Once you have the databases, you can build the connections, and then you can basically populate your schemas and run your regressions and all those those kinds of things. So this gives you a way to build bottom up using the waiter um, classes and starting from the lower uh, sets of sets of classes. Okay, I'm going to go back to the presentation. So um, that, that pretty much it. It, 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 it. I've shown you the core pattern, the re request response pattern. I even showed you updating, right? Because we had to do an update in order to do the security list changes for that uh, VCN's default security list. Okay, so we used that pattern. And, uh, you know, if it, and there's some other commands like list. It's the same pattern. It's just that you, you start out with a different command instead of a create or get, it's a list, okay? That gives you the idea. And now that really uh, comes to the end of uh, what, what we uh, wanted to talk about in terms of uh, giving you a way to get jump started with these uh, OCI APIs, specifically for database services. Again, I showed you Eclipse, I showed you Java. You could use .NET, you could use Visual Studio, or you can use whatever IDE you want. You just go out and grab your language SDK and pop it into your environment and you can build from there. But you'll see all the same kind of patterns, all the same kind of classes. Um, so hopefully you found this valuable. We did auto indexing a couple months back. We did auto scaling. We've now done these REST APIs. Next month, we're gonna look at machine learning and how easy it is to build machine learning based applications. And I think in particular with uh, OML Python, um, with uh, another guest speaker, Mark Hornick, who's going to come in. So a pretty exciting topic ne next month. And we'll continue uh, in this series to give you more of a deep dive on the autonomous stuff. So with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for, again, spending their time with me. Uh, hopefully you got, you got good value out of this. Um, though we'll publish the replay. And along with that, you'll get the um, PowerPoint and you'll also get the, um, uh, the code. I'll, I'll make the code available, although you can get the examples anyway. Yes, thanks, Robert. And thank you, everyone, for spending your time here with us today. Um, we hope that you'll join us again next month. Uh, we did. These are some additional resources that we'll have available once you're able to access the slides. Um, and we'll send out an email and also have that on the series page. And we did also want to let you know that we have um, and offer to gain hands-on exposure in a cloud trial environment. So this promo will allow you $500 in credit. So be sure to take advantage of that link. And um, please also feel free to keep in touch with Robert or send us any questions, any feedback and what you'd like to see next from us. So um, thanks again, everyone. Have a great day and we hope to see you next time.